Okay, hi everybody, we're back. Chapter nine, this is uh, lecture number two of three in this chapter. When we last met, we were talking about the uh, splicing of messenger RNA, um, and we're ready to begin a new section. And I want to uh, say from the outset that there is a section in the chapter that talks about the lactose operon. Uh, you can omit and skip that section. Where we want to begin um, today is talking a little bit about mutations, which are changes in the nucleic acids, specifically in the nitrogenous bases of the DNA. That can result in different proteins being produced, or maybe um, proteins of insufficient length whereby they don't function. So we're, we're gonna get into some of those different examples in just a few minutes. So when we talk about a mutation, we're talking again about a change in the genotype in the nitrogenous base of the DNA. And that can result in a change in the phenotype for that particular trait that we might be talking about. So go back know the difference between an organism's phenotype and its genotype, okay? The genotype, again, determines the phenotype. The phenotype is the physical characteristic being exhibited by the organism, and the genotype is what genes are present, inherited from the parents, that determine what that trait is. We're also going to define the difference between the so-called wild type strain and the mutant strain of a given, for a given characteristic. So the wild type strain is the characteristic that is thought of as non-mutated, the natural common characteristic. Um, for example, um, we talk about skin tone or skin color in humans, yet we know that um, there are people that lack melanin in their skin. We call those albino individuals where their skin is white, literally devoid of melanin. Well, that's due to a mutation that that individual inherited from his or her parents. Uh, not that I want to refer to somebody who is an albino as a mutant, but in, in a kind of true genetic sort of, sort of sense, um, that particular trait, no melanin, is considered the mutant characteristic. It's not common, right, in the population. It's very rare, in fact. So genetically inherited disorders can be thought of as a result, oftentimes, of mutations that occurred that were in turn passed on to the individual. And that could be, a, you know, a person. That could be a, a cow. could be a horse. could be an animal. could be a plant. Or, or it could even be a bacterium or a species of microorganism, too. Um, and so something that is, some characteristic that is considered a mutant strain um, is going to have a significant difference in, again, the normal un, or non-mutated wild type characteristic. I want you also to not necessarily assume that all mutations are bad. Now, we'll talk about some of the more serious effects of certain mutations, but as you're also going to see, mutations may also prove beneficial for a population as well. In fact, in biology, we talk about uh, mutation being the, the uh, really at the core of what's called microevolution. I won't get into that topic right now, but if you've ever taken biology and studied evolution, you might've heard the term microevolution. So that is uh, evolution at really the genetic scale or genetic level, I should say. And a lot of those alterations in DNA occur as a result of very rare mutations that prove uh, instrumental in affecting the, the phenotypes of that population. So what are some causes? Well, there are certain causes that we refer to as spontaneous mutations that just happen, again, spontaneously. There's no true um, source, like we're going to see in a few minutes. Um, that caused that particular mutation. It just means that as the DNA replicates, um, once in a blue moon, if you will, there can be a mismatch or a wrong base brought in 
Um, so when the DNA replicates, let's say, let's say we have a, a cytosine over here, uh, what would be over on the other side? What base? Cytosine here, guanine. If you said guanine, you're right. Well, once in a blue moon, you can get a cytosine thiamine or an adenine guanine connection. It's very, very rare, but it does occur. And we refer to this as a spontaneous mutation. And you can see the statistics here. Those mutations can be so rare that one in 10, what is, what is that, billion? I think one in every 10 billion base pairs that replicate will have a mismatch. Uh, it's a little more common in bacteria than it is in other uh, higher level cells like eukaryotic cells. Um, we're more familiar with what are referred to as induced mutations. These are changes in the DNA, changes in the nitrogenous bases due to exposure to known mutagens. And this table kind of talks a little bit about some examples of both chemical and radiation mutagens and what impact they have specifically on the DNA. Um, and a lot of these maybe won't make any sense right now, but after we talk about what mutations are in a little more detail at the uh, DNA level, then the effects here will, will make more sense to you. So you might want to come back and look at this table after we've talked more about mutations. But um, suffice to say, these again are phenomena that induce changes in the DNA. They disrupt the DNA. They influence the base pairing perhaps uh, in some way. And that in turn has major ramifications down the road in terms of what protein may or may not be produced by that cell. So let's talk about one particular type of mutation, again, at the nitrogen base level. And I'm gonna just play this video and let's listen to what a base pair substitution mutation is. Or not, let's try that again. A mutation occurs by base substitution when an incorrect base is incorporated into DNA. Some base substitutions occur because purines and pyrimidines exist in two structural forms. The most common form results in base pairing between adenine and thymine and between guanine and cytosine. However, the hydrogen atoms can move to form a base with altered hydrogen bonding properties, creating a tautomeric shift. When a tautomeric shift occurs in adenine, the adenine can bond to cytosine. A tautomeric shift in thymine allows it to bond to guanine. This error in DNA replication is passed on to the cell's progeny. The change in a single nucleotide in the DNA results in a change in the corresponding nucleotide in messenger RNA. The change in the codon can result in a different amino acid being incorporated into the protein. So this does a really great job. Um, let's go back to that slide. The protein. Here we're looking again at the mutation outlined here in purple. So instead of having an A and a T like we ordinarily would for this middle uh, pair of bases, we have a guanine opposite, opposite a cytosine. Now, again, that's an appropriate pairing, isn't it? But it's abnormal. There should be an A opposite a T, which we see in these other uh, newly replicated uh, double-stranded molecules. So the effect is that when T, T, C is transcribed into messenger RNA, it would be transcribed ordinarily as A, A, U. That would be the codon transcribed from this template strand of DNA. And hopefully you understand exactly what I just said having watched the previous lecture. So we can see here that later in translation, lysine will be brought in as an amino acid for that particular codon sequence of the DNA and the corresponding messenger RNA. However, 
when we look at the base pair substitution that has occurred here in the middle, instead of having AAG as the codon, we're going to have AGG, won't we? That notice brings in a totally different amino acid during translation. That would be defined as a mutant organism in the sense that that protein has the incorrect common natural amino acid that would ordinarily have been translated, okay? So now you can begin to see what we mean maybe by mutant. It has, an, has a different amino acid in this case due to this base pair substitution that occurred at the level of the DNA that of course is carried on in terms of the transcription of the messenger RNA. And as I said, likewise, a new base brought in or a new amino acid rather brought in during translation. In addition to base pair substitutions, we can talk about mutations that are referred to as base pair additions and base pair deletions. Well, let's think about that for a few minutes. If we add a base pair to an existing DNA molecule, or we pull out, delete a pair of nucleotides, what is that going to do down the road to the protein that's ultimately produced? Well, before we talk about that, let's make note that because we're talking about a single addition or a single deletion, we sometimes call these sorts of mutations point mutations because we're impacting just a single base pair. So the impact of these mutations, be they base pair substitutions or base pair additions or deletions, could be one of several possible outcomes. And you see those listed here. One possible outcome is that there is no significant alteration in the ultimate protein produced and therefore the protein functions like it's supposed to. And that's number three here, which we talk about as a silent mutation. So we can have a base pair substitution theoretically such that the codon manufactured during transcription in the messenger RNA may have originally been CAU, but now that gets shifted to CAC following transcription of that mutation, the change in the third base. And you'll notice that if you refer to that figure 915 in your book, and look up CAU and CAC, they both code for the same amino acid called histidine. So this is an example of what we call a silent mutation. It is a mutation. There's been an alteration in the third uh, base here of, of the DNA, which in turn changes the base in the messenger RNA. However, it's the same amino acid being coded for. So the protein is not going to look any different. It's not going to function any different uh, after the mutation has occurred. However, there are sometimes situations where we bring in a totally different amino acid like we saw in the preceding um, uh, example. And that single different amino acid could make the difference between the protein functioning, proper, functioning properly or more than likely a, a bad outcome where the protein is malformed. The classic example I can give you of how a single amino acid substitution within the polypeptide can have a significant impact on the phenotype is when you think about uh, sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. Somebody who has sickle cell disease has exactly what the name says. The, the red blood cells are sickle shaped rather than nice and round and biconcave, which is the, the wild type uh, phenotype. In somebody with sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease, due to a mutation that caused uh, a malformed hemoglobin protein, the result is a malformed red blood cell, who, which cannot carry the oxygen as efficiently as it should. Um, it cannot pass through uh, blood capillaries efficiently. They tend to plug up blood capillaries. Uh, and so there are major health impacts um, associated 
with this single substitution causing a different amino acid being brought in, in turn affecting the shape of the protein, in this case, the hemoglobin, and in turn the shape of the red blood cell, affecting its function in a bad sort of way. And then there are sometimes examples where an alteration to the DNA and a slightly different protein is made as a result of that mutation could make the protein function differently than it ordinarily would. And once in a blue moon, it may actually function in a, in a more beneficial way or in a positive way for the cell or for the organism. And in that way, it's a, it's, it's, it's a beneficial uh, uh, process that has occurred in a cell. So I don't want you to always, again, think about the negative aspects of mutations. Once in a while, they can have no impact, like we saw here with silent mutations, but sometimes they can have major ramifications whereby there's a bad outcome. So it, it, can, it can run the gamut, depends upon the type of mutation it is. This table in your book does a fairly nice job talking a little bit about these various mutations. And they use an example of a sentence to illustrate both substitution mutations and frame shift mutations. And the sentence reads here, the big bag, bad dog ate the fat red cat. So there's our, our sentence. This is the wild type non-mutated sequence, let's pretend, of bases. Now, I know they're not A's and T's and C's and G's, but let's pretend that these letters represent bases in a DNA molecule. If we talk about a frame shift mutation, let's say we introduce a base pair. So this would be an addition mutation. This would be a deletion mutation where we either insert a letter into the sentence, in this case, a B in front of the BA, or we remove an A here between the B and the D. Because remember, this was the original sentence. Well, what does that do to the sentence? If we insert a B here, a, a nitrogenous base, or we delete an A, an nitrogenous base, what does that do to the sentence downstream of the mutation? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Is there any impact up to the mutation? The answer is no. The sentence still reads the big B, okay? So we get through a part of the sentence, but look what it does. When you insert a letter, everything gets thrown off by a letter. Everything is thrown off and down the road by one letter because we've inserted that base. So the codon sequences are completely different. The same applies if we were to delete that A and we keep these three letter words uh, that we had appear together. Suddenly these are not words anymore, are they? So, so this is a, a good example of how, um, again, frame shift mutations typically always result in malformed proteins. This is 99% of the time, these insertions and deletions uh, induce frame shifts, and these frame shifts result in massive alterations in the protein being made to the point at which they don't work the way they're supposed to. Now, we saw a few minutes ago, whereby if we substituted, let's say, an A for an A in bad, that doesn't change the, the sentence at all, does it? So again, it can have no impact. It can have bad impact. Um, what if we introduced a letter or even removed a letter, they could be insertions and deletions, that prematurely inserted a stop codon? Remember those stop codons we talked about, the three of those in the preceding lecture in that table? Go look it up. Well, if you introduce a stop codon prematurely, you're stopping translation right there and then. So suddenly this sentence becomes the big bad and it stops right there because of the insertion of a stop codon. And 99.999999% of the time that has a bad impact. You, you can't produce a protein if you 
prevent translation, you know, for 75% of the, for the messenger RNA. So spend some time studying this table. Well, lucky for us in our cells and even prokaryotic cells, there are systems in place that can often recognize and repair mutations. So let's talk a little bit about some of the repair mechanisms, which are typically enzymatic repair mechanisms that cells have at their disposal. We're talking here about both prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So whether it's a spontaneous mutation or an induced mutation, sometimes they can be identified and repaired and no harm done to the cell and the organism. Now you remember in, in the earlier lecture, uh, we talked about DNA polymerase and the role that it played in DNA replication. The unzipping of the hydrogen bonds between the DNA strands, the insertion of the new DNA nucleotides, right? Well, here's another function we can add to DNA polymerase, and that is its role in proofreading the replication of the DNA and the repair also of that um, potential mismatch. I'm going to show you a video on that in just about 30 seconds. These other examples, again, kind of are self-explanatory, mismatch repair. So if there's a, a mismatch, a T opposite a C, um, we can remove the C and put in an A, right, to make sure that they do complement one another. So even if it gets past DNA polymerase, some of these mismatch repair enzymes can catch it. So there's sort of like a redundancy in the process, which is kind of interesting. If we have a plant we're talking about and there is some ultraviolet light damage done, this, this particular induced mutation uh, has induced change in the DNA of the plant, there are these various light repair enzymes that plants use to find that mismatch and correct it. Um, and I think incision repair kind of gets back at that idea that we can cut out the wrong base pair and put the correct one in. So there are these, these repair mechanisms at work. So let's watch this, this video talking about the proofreading enzyme DNA polymerase. Although mistakes can happen during DNA replication, they are extraordinarily rare. A key reason for this is the proofreading function of DNA polymerase. Roughly one out of every 100,000 to 1 million bases attached to the three prime end of a growing DNA chain will be a mismatch, improperly base pairing with the complementary strand. When such a mismatch occurs, DNA chain elongation generally pauses. This pause allows spontaneous melting of the end of the DNA strand being synthesized freeing the three prime end with the mismatched base to enter a three prime exonuclease site on the DNA polymerase. The exonuclease site catalyzes the removal of several nucleotides from the three prime end of the growing strand. Only the removal of the nucleotide carrying the mismatched base is shown here, though additional nucleotides would actually be removed. Following removal in the three prime to five prime direction, DNA polymerase can then resume its synthesis activity in the five prime to three prime direction. The proofreading function reduces the overall error rate to as low as about one in a hundred million for DNA polymerase three. Okay, there's a section in the book that talks about the AIMS test. Um, you can omit that. Uh, short section. There's also a corresponding figure that goes with it too, and you can again just omit that. Okay, so to summarize, the fact that mutations can't have negative impacts on cells, but they can also have positive impacts as well. We've talked about how sometimes we can have premature uh, stop codons introduced, which stop translation in its tracks, resulting in a non-functional protein being made. We can talk about how once in a while an incorrect um, amino acid being brought in during translation can have big impacts on the cell. And think back to that example I gave of uh, sickle cell disease. 
But I want us to stop and ponder, as I alluded to earlier, the fact that once in a while, mutations can have beneficial impacts on the organism. So this gets back to what I was talking about earlier with respect to microevolution. The fact that sometimes mutations can result in a, a different or a more effective protein being produced by the cell. And if that turns out to be um, um, a protein that allows the cell to metabolize a particular substrate more efficiently, then the cell is going to survive. And that particular beneficial uh, attribute is going to be passed on to the progeny. The progeny, of course, being the cells produced by that parent cell, if we're talking about a bacterium, for example. And so anytime we talk about beneficial mutations, beneficial genetic changes that confer an advantage to the population of cells, again, we'll talk about the, the bacteria here, then that is going to be retained in what we call the gene pool of that population, which is all the genes of all the traits of all the organisms in that population. This has direct impact on drug resistance and how this can develop, for example, in bacteria. We'll talk more about drug resistance coming up a little bit later. So here's a concept check question. Which of the following mutations would cause a frame shift? A shift in the sequence of the bases, which in turn influence what amino acids will be brought in by transfer RNA during translation. If you said deletion mutation, you were right. OK, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about recombination of DNA. What are some ways in which organisms like bacteria can acquire new genes from other organisms? So this is not talking about mutations at all, how new combinations can be created as a result of mutations. This is talking about exchange and transfer and acceptance of genes from other organisms of oftentimes the same species, but doesn't always have to be the same species. And so we're going to talk about these three ways in which bacteria can acquire new genes. Conjugation, transformation, and transduction. Let's start off with conjugation. This is one of the easier concepts to understand. Conjugation. We're going to talk about two different kinds of conjugation, physical and F-factor transfer conjugation. Let's talk about transfer now here of some DNA in the form of a plasmid, or it could be a small chunk of chromosome. We're going to use the example of a plasmid here for the most part. From one cell to another. And this process of donation of genetic material from a donor to an acceptor cell occurs across something called a sex pilus, or some people pronounce it pilus. So what we have here is a cell that we refer to as an F plus cell, this little superscript plus. This is often depicting the donor. The F minus cell is the recipient. OK. And what's going on here, we're going to talk about how a pilus forms from the donor across to the recipient. So the donor has the means with which to produce this structure called a sex pilus, through which it will transfer some DNA in the form of a plasmid. So you can again see how the F plus cell has extended its sex pilus to the F minus recipient cell. This sex pilus sort of contracts 
and the cells are brought closer together. This is going to lead to the eventual transmission of what's called an F factor plasmid across the sex pilus to the recipient cell. And here's that process in more detail. Okay, so we're talking here about primarily gram-negative cells that have this ability to produce this sex pilus. So again, to orient you, here's the donor cell, F superscript plus. Here's the recipient, F superscript minus. Here's that bridge, the sex pilus that has been formed by the donor across to the recipient. Here's the F factor plasmid. F stands for fertility factor. Fertility factor, meaning that if you have an F factor plasmid, you have the ability to form the sex pilus. You have the ability to conjugate. Okay, so our recipient cell here in green, as you can see initially, lacks the F factor. That's why we think of it as the recipient cell. It's going to receive that F factor plasmid. And so in the middle diagram, we're seeing replication of the plasmid, which remember is extra chromosomal DNA. This little circular structure is DNA, not part of the chromosome, extra chromosomal. We use that term to describe the plasmid. And in the F plus cell, not only has it formed the conjugation sex pilus, but it's also now replicating its F factor plasmid. And you can see that that F factor uh, plasmid is being, being, being transferred across the sex pilus into the F minus cell, which when it acquires that F factor plasmid is by definition now F plus, because it has the, fact, the F factor plasmid. And it too can conjugate with another F minus cell and do the same thing that the blue cell did to it, if you will. So this ability to transfer genetic material occurs thanks to the formation of a sex pilus, which is produced if the cell has an F factor plasmid. If you don't have it, you can't produce the sex pilus. This is not the sole uh, plasmid type of plasmid that can be transferred across. When we talk about drug resistance, we can talk about drug resistant characteristics being being carried or held in certain other types of plasmids. They're called R factor. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And when you transfer an R factor plasmid from one cell to another, you are allowing drug resistance to be propagated or, or transferred to another cell that ordinarily would not be able to fight that particular drug because it didn't have the plasmid. Let's watch this video that talks about physical conjugation. Conjugation is a mechanism of gene transfer that requires direct contact between donor and recipient cells. A plasmid is a small piece of DNA, separate from the main chromosome, that carries genetic information for such things as antibiotic resistance. The first step in plasmid transfer is contact between the donor and the recipient. The pillus of the donor cell recognizes and binds to specific receptor sites on the cell wall of the recipient cell. The plasmid then becomes mobilized for transfer when an enzyme cleaves one strand of the plasmid at a specific nucleotide sequence called the origin of transfer. A single strand of the plasmid beginning at the origin of transfer, enters the recipient cell. Once inside the recipient cell, a complementary strand to the single DNA strand is synthesized. When donor and recipient cells are mixed together, eventually all of the cells become donors. Okay, so that sort of reviews what we just talked a little bit about previously. The acquisition in 
this example of the F factor allows the cell to be able to produce these sex pili. Conjugation. Let's watch another video that talks a little bit more about conjugation. Bacterial conjugation is a process of genetic transfer between bacterial cells that requires direct contact between the cells. Many, but not all, species of bacteria can conjugate. Conjugation can occur between cells of the same species or even between cells of two different species. A small DNA circle or plasmid called the F factor is required for conjugation. The F factor stands for fertility factor. Strains of bacteria containing the F factor are called F plus. Those without it are called F minus. An F plus cell or donor produces a structure called a pilus to connect with another recipient cell. To begin conjugation, the F factor is cut at a specific region called the origin of transfer by a protein assembly called the relaxosome, which associates with the strand to be transferred, or the tDNA strand. Accessory proteins of the relaxosome are released, but a portion of the relaxosome called the relaxase remains attached to the tDNA. This tDNA relaxase complex is recognized by a coupling factor and transferred to the exporter, a complex in the F plus cell that is contiguous with the pilus. The exporter pumps the tDNA relaxase complex into the recipient cell. Once the entire tDNA molecule is transferred to the recipient cell, relaxase joins the ends to make a circular DNA molecule. As the tDNA is transferred to the recipient cell, it is replicated to become double-stranded. In the donor cell, the F-factor DNA was also replicated to become double-stranded. This actually occurred as the tDNA was being transferred to the recipient cell. In the end, both cells wind up with a complete double-stranded copy of the F-factor. Their connection through the pilus is released and each is now an F plus cell that can go on to conjugate with other cells. Okay, nice little video. Okay. There is another type of conjugation that your book talks about called high frequency um, recombination conjugation. I am not gonna get into that um, so you can omit that short little blurb that talks about HFR. So we just talked about how the F factor plasmid allowed a cell to produce a sex pilus. And if that was uh, replicated and transferred to a recipient cell, that that cell would gain the ability to produce a sex pilus. But I also said not too long ago that there are other plasmids that some bacteria have called R factor plasmids, R stands for resistance plasmids, which allow the cell to resist the action of drugs, antibiotics and other drugs. And so we know that drug resistance in bacteria has become a real issue in our world today. It's really been an issue for several decades, but it's become even more of an issue now where we're having difficulty developing antibiotics to kill off certain particularly nasty strains of bacteria. And there's lots of reasons why resistance has increased over the years. I'm not gonna get into that right now, but do understand that this ability to resist the action of, of antibiotics, let's say, um, that unique ability of a cell bacterium to negate the action of penicillin or amoxicillin or whatever the case may be, is often due to the cell possessing a particular plasmid that has the instruction booklet that tells the cell how to circumvent the action of the drug, to get around the drug so that it doesn't hurt the cell. It can also increase um, virulence within bacteria. Not only can you resist the action of the drug, but maybe you can resist the action of the phagocytic white cell that's trying to kill you. And there are different tricks that bacteria have to do that. Or maybe you can more efficiently stick to a substrate than you ordinarily could if you didn't have that particular plasmid. Or maybe you can secrete a really nasty toxin, a neurotoxin that you wouldn't be able to produce if you had not had that particular R-factor plasmid. 
And so these plasmids are being transferred from bacteria to bacteria all the time. And this is one way, again, that uh, cells can acquire genetics, genes from other bacterial cells, and that can prove beneficial to the population of bacteria. Not so good for us, but good for the bacteria. A second type of gene transfer is called transformation. And this was actually pioneered by an English um, physician back in the 1920s by the name of Frederick Griffith. He was a British uh, medical officer who um, worked on a particular strain of Streptococcus, which you see here called Streptococcus pneumoniae, strep pneumoniae. And he did some work in his laboratory in London, looking at two different strains of strep pneumoniae. One strain he was able to uh, culture in his laboratory, he called the S strain of strep pneumoniae. Now, why did he call it the S strain? Well, when he cultured these in his lab in the Petri plates and he examined the colonies under his microscope, the cells, uh, the colonies, I should say, appeared to have a smooth sort of appearance to them, if you will. And so he gave them the name smooth strain. And what ended up happening was when he examined these cells under the microscope, when he did you know, the staining that, that you guys did not too long ago, capsule stain, he discovered that strep pneumoniae, the S strain of strep, possessed a capsule which, as you may know, provides increased virulence to that strain of strep. So he took these, these living S strain strep and he injected them into healthy mice and the mice died. Not surprising, given the fact that the capsule provided increased virulence to these bacteria and overwhelmed the immune system of the mouse and the mouse died not just one mouse, but many, many mice, I'm sure. He had various experimental groups that he was working with. He also cultured in his laboratory another type of strep pneumoniae whose colonies under the microscope had a, a much different morphology or shape. And so he called these the R or rough strain of Streptococcus pneumoniae. And he came to understand when he examined these under the microscope after staining them, that these particular species, this particular strain, I should say, of strep pneumoniae lacked a capsule. So they're non-encapsulated strep pneumoniae, the R strain. So he took some living R strain strep and he injected them into some healthy mice and the mice were fine. So the lack of the capsule meant that these uh, cells could be easily overcome by the immune system of the mouse and phagocytized and destroyed and no infection and subsequent ill effects occurred to the mice. Then what he did was he took some S strain strep, that which contains the capsule, that which ordinarily when injected into the healthy mice would kill them, and he subjected these living S strain strep to heat. We, we refer to this as heat killing the S strain strep. So he heated them sufficiently where he, he knocked them out, killed them. He took those heat killed S strain strep after he let this cool down and he injected those into healthy mice and the mice survived. So far, you might think, well, that makes sense because these S strain strep cells are dead. They're not going to cause any sort of problem to the mouse, right? Okay, here's the interesting thing he did next. He took some heat killed S strain strep, same as here, and he added to those heat killed S strain strep some living R. Okay, so he's got living R strain strep in his syringe. He's got heat killed S strain in the same syringe. He injected 
a group of mice with that combo and all the mice died. What's going on here? Well, when he did an autopsy, if you will, uh, or a necropsy on those mice and examined the fluids, the body fluids of the mouse, he found living R and S strain strep in the mice. Not surprising that he found perhaps living R strain, but the fact that he got living S strain, living encapsulated bacteria, how did that happen? I mean, these were heat killed, they're dead. How do we get living S strain? Well, the reason that we got living S strain strep is because these living R strain strep took up some of the DNA that was given off when these cells lysed and were destroyed by the heat. So the R strain, the living R strain that would ordinarily be non-pathogenic acquired the, the genes in terms of now being able to synthesize their own capsule. So some of those R strain strep became S strain. They got the DNA from the surrounding environment, incorporated it into their genome, produced the capsule. So we talk about the cells having undergone a transformation. That's where the word comes from. The S, the R strain strep were transformed into living S due to this acceptance, this absorption, if you will, of small pieces of DNA from the surroundings, in this case, again, from the dead S strain. Enough DNA to provide the instruction booklet to the living R strain strep to be able to produce their own capsules. And if you have a living S strain, we know what's gonna happen. Mice are gonna die. Overwhelms the immune system of the mice. Okay. So what we're talking about is a cell, like an R strain strep cell, accepting that DNA, from the environment that came from the heat killed S strain strep. So for example, let's pretend this is an R strain cell. Here in blue, or in red rather, is the gene that has the instruction booklet, if you will, built in to allow for capsule formation. So here's the R strain strep cell taking in that DNA from the heat killed S. It can do that because it has a particular surface receptor to accept that small chunk of DNA. We call this cell a competent cell because it has that particular receptor on its surface. That DNA is brought into the cell. It incorporates itself into the chromosome of the R strain strep and literally is transformed into S strain strep, which again has the ability now to synthesize an outer protective capsule. Now, what's really kind of interesting is the fact that we don't always have to have the same species of bacteria for this to take place. We did talk about RNS strain streptococcus pneumoniae in our example, in the work that Griffith did. But the reality is that you can have unrelated species of bacteria exchanging or taking up, I guess is the better word to use, taking in this DNA from the surroundings that came from a different species of bacteria. And if that proves to be a positive for the cell, beneficial in this case, i.e. forming the capsule or becoming more virulent or negating the action of phagocytic white cells, that's a positive thing, isn't it? For the cell, for the, for the population. Um, so again, donor recipient cells don't have to be related. There's no need for direct contact like we had with conjugation in the sex pilus bridge, right? This, this comes from the surroundings. 
And what we've been able to do, having learned about transformation in bacteria, is we've been able in recombinant DNA technology, which we'll get into more in chapter 10, we can introduce desired genes into bacteria. We humans can take traits, we can insert the DNA that we know contains the gene for that given desirable trait, whatever it might be, insert that into the cell or let the cell take it up by itself. That gets incorporated into the genome of the cell and the cell will synthesize whatever it is we want it to make for us. That's how a lot of, of uh, different kinds of hormones are produced today. Uh, artificial hormones like insulin, so a lot of it's made from microorganisms. Uh, prior to DNA technology, most non-human insulin came from pigs. And to, so to get them from pigs was a very laborious, expensive proposition. Now we can grow as much bacteria as we want in the laboratory and industrial you know, containers and siphon off the, uh, the insulin hormone and use it. It's pretty amazing. So as it mentions here also in the last bullet, the fact that genes for antibiotic resistance can also be uh, picked up this way in addition to um, you know, R factor plasmid transfer via conjugation as we discussed uh, you know, a few minutes ago, you can also get antibiotic resistance and drug resistance occurring through this this absorption, if you will, of DNA from the surroundings. So it just further um, exemplifies, I think, um, the fact that, that cells are always taking up different genetic information, different pieces of DNA, and if it should prove helpful to the cell, um, it proves helpful to the cell. Our last uh, example of gene transfer from bacterium to bacterium involves the bacteriophage or bacteriophage, I like to pronounce it, in a process called transduction. If you remember from the virus chapter, which seems like such a long time ago now, I think it was, um, what was it, chapter? Six, yeah. The bacteriophage was a virus that targeted bacteria, if you recall. Go back and review the bacteriophage biology. And so here we're talking about a virus that infects bacteria that is helping to transfer bacterial DNA from one cell to another cell. Now, unlike transformation, which we said involved, could involve the uh, uptake of DNA from a totally different species of bacteria. In transduction, because of the specificity with respect to how certain bacteriophages target specific bacterial cells, you don't tend to have trans transduction taking place, say, between E. coli and staph pneumoniae, or club cell pneumoniae and bacillus megatherium, okay? you're not going to have this process take place between uh, different species. This typically would take place within the same species, but between different cells of different populations of the same species with the help of a virus. Yeah, so here we're talking about a virus being beneficial to bacteria in the long run. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of different examples of transduction. The first one here, of course, called generalized. Um, the second one's called specialized transduction. So let's talk about this one first, the random uh, transfer of DNA from one bacterial cell to another with the help of a virus. So when a virus, bacteriophage virus, we'll show it here in, in blue, when it invades or attacks, we'll say, not invades, attacks, attacks the cell, Let's pretend this is E. coli. Here it is injecting its phage DNA into the cell. We've talked about this before. This is nothing new. Go back and review this in the previous chapter if you've forgotten how it works. Here's the bacterial chromosome in, in blue, but this is the phage DNA in red. 
Now, what happens within the cell? Well, you remember that the cell takes and will replicate that phage DNA, will also produce um, more phage protein capsid, package that phage DNA in the capsid, and eventually the cell will lyse and out will go the newly formed virus particles, right? Only here, what I want you to note is that the phage particles that are leaving the cell, when the cell lyses, when the cell pops, yes, there are some viral particles that are containing viral DNA, shown here in red, okay, just like the, the virus that attacked or, or, or uh, uh, you know, came into contact with this cell initially. But I want you to look here at this guy that has the blue colored DNA. What is that DNA? That is DNA that is taken up from the host. It's part of the chromosome that got separated from the chromosome and has gotten then packaged inside the protein capsids. When this particular virion or viral particle goes to invade another E. coli, like it's doing here, it's injecting its DNA only where is that DNA from? Well, it came from the DNA of the donor cell, right? It's blue. And that then is incorporated into the chromosome of cell number two. It's not phage DNA incorporated. It's bacterial DNA coming from cell number one, we'll call it, and it's getting incorporated into the genome of cell number two. Okay, so I want you to be very clear in your understanding of the fact that in generalized transduction, we're talking about the transfer of bacterial DNA from one cell to another with the virus, the bacteriophage, acting as the, the conduit, the, the transfer mechanism, if you will, okay, that allows that to happen. So theoretically, you could have drug-resistant characteristics, genes here, a gene or more, and if that drug's characteristic gets transferred in the form of that DNA, then, then cell number two now has the ability to negate the action of a drug, for example, that ordinarily would not have had because it didn't have the instruction booklet, if you will. It was provided that by the phage. The second type of transduction is a little more complicated, and so we call it specialized transduction, where we're talking about a particular part of the bacterial genome, not a more random region of the bacterial chromosome, but a specific segment of bacterial chromosome that's being transferred by the phage. So I want you to look at the top of this diagram and you'll see we have a bacterial cell. And we're talking here about a prophage which you remember from the earlier chapter, is a piece of circular chromosome. Um, blue is indicating bacterial chromosome. Red is indicating that this was previously part of the virus that was inserted into the cell. The cell did not go into the lytic cycle. It went into the lysogenic cycle. Okay, remember that. Go back and review that if you don't know what I'm talking about. So here's the prophage of the cell, part viral DNA, mostly bacterial DNA in the chromosome. When that cell goes from the lysogenic cycle into the lytic cycle, the result will be the synthesis of new virions, new viral particles, new bacteriophage within the host cell. That has happened here. But notice what these bacteriophages contain. If you look super close, you'll see there's some red and there's some blue. Now, where did that red and blue come from? Well, it came from the DNA, came from the prophage, because this gets replicated, right? And some of that is going to get incorporated into the phage particles. So when they leave the cell, when the cell lyses, and now are released thousands of virions, bacteriophages, some of those are likely going to go on 
to invade another healthy cell. And that's what's going on here. So we have one of these virions attaches to another cell, E. coli, we'll say, or whatever bacteria you want to talk about. It injects its DNA, but notice it has both bacterial and viral DNA in it. It's both blue and red. And this can get incorporated into the genome of the new cell, as we see has occurred here. So in dark uh, purple, or I guess that's purple, is the original chromosome. But now it's got some light blue and some red that gets incorporated again into the chromosome itself. Remember, that light blue is what? Well, that's DNA from cell number one. What's red? Well, that's prophage DNA. That is viral DNA. Um, once in a while, the viral DNA will um, sort of form a separate little plasmid. That's what's shown here. And we just see incorporation now of, this may not even be a plasma, but it's, it's separate viral DNA. But what has happened here, it's the genome of cell number two, is the incorporation of a specific part of that uh, DNA from the original donor cell. So let's watch a little video on this. Specialized transduction involves the transfer of only a few specific genes from one bacterial cell to another by means of a phage. The lambda phage, which infects E. coli, is a well-studied example of a specialized transducing phage. When lambda phage infects E. coli, the phage DNA enters the cell and then integrates into a specific site on the host chromosome. When an E. coli culture carrying the lambda phage is induced, phage particles are produced. On rare occasions, a piece of bacterial DNA, for example, the gal gene, near the specific site of insertion remains attached to the phage DNA and a piece of phage DNA is left behind. The phage that develop are defective because they do not carry the entire phage genome but can still infect other cells. The defective phage can attach to another bacterial cell and the DNA can be injected. Both phage and bacterial DNA now become integrated into the new host chromosome. Only bacterial genes located near the site of integration of the phage DNA can be transduced, hence the term specialized transduction. So the big difference between uh, specialized and generalized transduction is the fact that in specialized transduction, we're transferring a specific piece of that genetic material from the original donor cell to the recipient cell. In generalized transduction, um, there's, again, a more generalized transfer of, of more unspecialized DNA from one cell to another, both of which, again, require the bacteriophage as a, as a vector, if you will, for that transfer. Specialized. Okay, this table, I think, does a very nice job kind of comparing and contrasting the three types of genetic recombination we just talked about, conjugation, transformation, and transduction. Um, I would spend some time, of course, studying those three, but if you wanna come and kind of see where all three are kind of laid out one next to the other, where you can kind of see the differences, um, this is a, an excellent table to spend some time looking at. The last topic of this uh, particular lecture is uh, on a topic um, that was discovered um, basically back in the 1970s. So it's, it's about 50 years old, I guess. We, prior to this time, we had no idea that this occurred. Um, and there was an individual um, by the name of Barbara McClintock. And um, she won a Nobel Prize for her work uh, uh, in the discovery of transposons. Um, I forget what school she was at, but um, she worked um, on Indian corn or maize. If you know, in the fall of the year, people will often, you know, buy multicolored kerneled cobs of corn for decoration. And so that's uh, what she was studying. What was causing the different pigmentations in the individual kernels of corn? She was able to, to, to explain why you get such a diverse array of colors in a single ear of corn. Um, other thing that I'll just quickly mention about, about uh, Dr. McClintock uh, 
Um, she studied this when she was a young woman, probably right after grad school. So she was probably in her 30s and she continued to work on this uh, through her entire adult life. And she was ridiculed um, relentlessly by colleagues at major prestigious institutions who really poo-pooed her the research she was doing on this. Um, and again, I, I guess it's just worth mentioning that if you are driven and you know you have sound science behind you. Um, don't let people dissuade you. And I'm not talking just about science or microbiology, but just in, in life, I think, um, you know, stand, stand firm, stand strong to your convictions um, because um, she came out ahead in the long run. She was recognized, as I said, for Nobel Prize. I mean, the ultimate prize that any scientist can, I think, get. Um, because of her tenacity and her hard work and her good science that she did. So transposons are called jumping genes and, and they're just really interesting, strange things to study. And so what we're talking about, um, which turns out to be very widespread, not only in eukaryotic cells like the Indian corn that, that Dr. McClintock was working with, but we've also since discovered that jumping genes occur in, in our cells, and they can occur in the DNA of viruses too. So it, it, it occurs in all genetic material of all cells and, and even non-cells like, um, like viruses. And I wouldn't be surprised um, if this also occurred um, you know, in, in virioids, right? Um, or prions too, I would not be surprised. So what we're talking about here is a, a segment of DNA. So here we're, we're looking at it here within the chromosome of a bacterial cell. Um, now I'm not showing here um, a prophage, although it, it could be, you could view it as a prophage, I guess, but let's just think of it as a particular gene, which is defined as a segment of the DNA that codes for a particular protein. We'll, we'll assume that's the definition of a gene for our discussion. And what we're talking about is the ability of that particular gene to jump within and among the genome of the chromosome. So obviously when we compare cell one to cell two, we can see that the, the gene has, has, has kind of jumped, if you will, has, has broken free here, but reattached somewhere else. Or sometimes what can happen is it can make multiple copies of itself and insert, be inserted at different regions within the single chromosome of the bacterial cell. It's crazy. Um, you can also have transfer not only from one region of the chromosome to another area like we see from like one to two, but we can also see transfer as it mentions here in bullet number three from a chromosome into a fully fledged plasmid or from a plasmid into part of the chromosome. It's crazy. Um, and that's sort of what's shown here. Here we have that segment of red, the gene of interest that has been inserted into the, into the plasmid. And of course, as we know from, from uh, conjugation, we can have transfer, can't we, of that plasmid from one cell to another across that sex pilus. So you can kind of see how these jumping genes can occur within a cell, but also can occur among different cells as well. And there appears to be some benefits sometimes to these jumping genes, or there can sometimes be harmful impacts as it pertains to the host cell. So I guess beneficial from the bacterial point of view. Um, let's watch a, a video on transposons. Transposons are segments of DNA that are capable of shifting from one location to another. A transposon enters the cell by being carried on a plasmid. A transposon can then move from the plasmid into the host cell genome. A transposon can move from one site on the host genome to another site on the host genome. When some transposons move, they replicate, leaving a copy in the original position. <laughs> 
A transposon can also move from the host genome to a plasmid. Okay, so check out that short little section in your book that talks about transposons. I'm going to end this lecture uh, here. We have a, a short additional uh, lecture to do before we wrap up um, chapter nine.